I've read the short story and I've seen the movie. I love both of them, but there are some differences. Uh, how did you approach taking what was there in the short story and then, and then building on it to do something cinematic? Well, my prime directive was to take the way the short story made me feel mm -hmm. and kind of gently lift that from the source material and find a way to transplant that into a film um, because I was just emotionally affected by the short so much. Um, uh, I found later that the biggest challenge was really how to make it cinematic mm -hmm. because Ted's st story works so well as a piece of literary fiction but it didn't need conflict the way that a movie does. Uh, and so the first big change that I had to make was uh, in the way that the aliens communicated with us. In the story, they, they deliver basically intergalactic TV screens and we have a very long, expensive Skype call with them. Right. Um, and it goes for about a year, really, mm -hmm. uh, of just back and forth, uh, or a prolonged period of time. And that made for a very flat narrative uh, for film. The, the big change that I made early on that had a giant ripple effect and, and sort of set me on a course from then on was to have them show up at our front door and have it be a face-to-face -face meeting. And as a first contact story, it created a lot of tension and a lot of geopolitical panic that allowed me some tension to escalate throughout the film. So I talked to uh, Seth Shostak at the SETI Institute about uh, this, and he said, yeah, the aliens come for like thousands of light years, and they stop at like the last 20 feet. Yeah. So yeah, why, why, did, why did they not land? It was, a, it was a great line that Jeremy Renner's character had, in fact. He says, like, they came light years away. Why can't they go another 20 feet? That was absolutely, it was in the script for a very, very long time. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think the answer there and this is me covering for Denis a little yeah, bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is that um, they could only go so far, and this is how far they were holding out their hand, and we needed to, to meet it a little bit. We needed to show that we could at least go that far. Interesting. So uh, one of the choices that's uh, a little bit different in the book compared to the movie is that her daughter dies of an accident, I think, in the short story, and it's a disease, I guess, in the movie. Um, that gets us into a little bit of this, you know, I thought in the short story, I would want to try to prevent this accident if I could, obviously. Sure. Uh, and it's less obvious in the movie that, that she even could do that. Correct. But it, it does make you think in the short story, okay, she has so adopted the alien way of thought yeah. that, and, and it really gets to this question of free will, that, that right. maybe there is no free will. Correct. And, uh, but there's a little room for doubt about free will in, in the movie version. Can you that talk about that? Is right, and that's kind of where Ted and I diverge. Not necessarily in our belief systems, because you know what he uses for a story doesn't necessarily reflect his own beliefs. I know the message that is baked into story of your life is more the idea of embracing the inevitable, in that this is if this is a deterministic world, in that um, there is no sense of free will there, that. Louise comes to terms with that and finds a peace knowing that she can't do anything, apparently, to, to save her daughter. And I'm a little more, I guess, rebellious <laughs> in my belief that um, I need free will. Even if it's an illusion, I need to believe in that. And the idea of Louise having a choice uh, and being able to make a different choice if she wanted to, mm -hmm. but committing to the same one, knowing where the end is, and knowing that there is a, this unstoppable disease that she can't help. It's more profound for me. It's, a, it's a, an emotional connection between a mother and a child. And it's why, actually there's a line of dialogue in the scene where um, they're talking to each other uh, and uh, she talks about why the, her father, uh, Hannah's father, left. Um, and she talks about the unstoppable disease. She says, it's kind of like you with your swimming trophies and your poetry. And the reason that's so important to me as a line of dialogue is it's talking about where Louise's head is. And it's realizing that the child she has has a much greater ripple effect on the world. She, has, she is a child, a human being, that has contributions to other people that end up being inspirations, that end up having a, an emotional or even psychological impact far greater than just her own. And removing that child from the world, even from a future, could have a potentially disastrous effect that she doesn't even know about. But it does introduce a, a bit of a paradox in that uh, when she goes to the gets to the future that she already knows about. She has to keep doing the same things. What if she, what if she did uh, change a slightly different thing? Like she, she didn't I, talk to the general in the future. 
I think there are moments where you can infer that she did change some things. I believe in my heart of hearts that she told Ian something differently or delayed telling him about what she knew about their daughter and tried to, to hedge that so that she, keep that she kept that marriage intact and it still didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think part of that is knowing the future and trying to figure out what you can and cannot change or how, how much you can steer that ship and, and course correct. Um, and I think for a while, her experience, her nonlinear experience with this, having been subjected to the nonlinear experience of, of, of time through the uh, heptapod language, um, a lot of it happens on a subconscious level where mm -hmm. she doesn't know until she's out of the, the fugue that something has happened. But the more that it happens to her, and we kind of go on a logarithmic scale throughout the movie, the more she becomes aware in the moment that she's now been displaced. And the first time we really get that hint is when she asks Hannah, what day is this? Yeah. Uh, and the first time she realizes that she can change the future is the non-zero sum game moment, where she f comes back to it and starts to understand she has a little more control of that space. But it makes her f confused about where she is. And that awareness starts to like push against her normal path of time because now she's not only affecting it, she's aware that she is moving around from one time to the next. Had she not had that big moment uh, at, toward the end where she was bouncing around between two timelines, I don't think she would have to ask the general any of those questions. I think it had already happened and she would know. But she asked the question, oh yeah, we did have a conversation, didn't we? It's not coming to me yet. It's because she's having a kind of a um, whiplash effect from going back and forth. So if she can in fact change time a bit, does that undercut any of the, um, well, one of the great things about the aliens is that they have a truly different conception of time and language and physics, and it's all sort of wrapped up together in, right. the, in the short story. And, yeah. um, and that's because they are perceiving uh, time so differently that their equations of physics are different because there's no real cause and effect, right? There's, uh, yeah. so simple things like motion uh, to us are, are simple, but it's complicated to them. Whereas right. calculus, uh, certain things that we yeah. write complicated calculus equations about right. are very simple to them. Yeah, um, the so real that's, big variable stuff is they're, they're easy, like, you know, Fermat's principle of least time comes right. into play there. Right, so w how much of that was in the script and then and then cut out of the, the final film? We had a lot in the script. Mm -hmm. We had too much in the script, Andrew, honestly. I think it was just a whole bunch there that just didn't, didn't need to be in the final film, mm -hmm. but was a necessary element to making it, which is a weird way of, of getting there. But um, yeah, we had a lot more time with Jeremy Renner's character where we get to see Ian talk about a lot of these principles and the fact that they have a, have a much better view of the world. I even hint that the heptapods live for thousands of years because if they know what's happening 3,000 years from now, it's because that's their lifespan. And that makes Abbott's death all the more profound because he's sacrificing a millennia or more uh, in order to make sure that we receive the gifts so that our race can somehow help them in three millennia from now. So yeah, about that, did, so he knows that there's going to be this explosion, but then just decides to uh, die anyway? Is that the, the idea? He knows that they, he can't, they can't give the gift of our language until Louise has absorbed enough of it that she can then decode it later. Mm -hmm. If they give all that information too early, then no one knows what really it means, and they don't have enough information with them, and they don't have enough of her or effect on it to decode it later. They have to get it to a certain point. Sadly, that point also coincides with the panic and the, and the attack and all of that. And that, uh, and that nexus point is where Abbott realizes one of them has to die and he sacrifices himself knowing that it means uh, the world for everybody else. He probably already knows that. He already probably knows that his death has a significance later on. Right, so yeah, this uh, it's hinted at in the movie that the Earth somehow saves the aliens. Uh, and so unlike some movies where the aliens just come and want to be altruistic or they just want to come and be violent, in this case, they have a, a motivation of their own, which they do. makes them more compelling characters. Um, did you write any more about that motivation or did you just decide to leave it a mystery about what actually happens between the Earth oh, and the Oh, what aliens? actually happens? Yeah. No, I just, there was a slightly different uh, way that I mentioned it. I believe that when Costello reveals that to Louise, he says, we're here to return the favor mm. because 3,000 years from now you help us. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and that's just the way they think, you know. They, they don't have necessarily put uh, one piece before the other um, chronologically the way we do. Right. Um, and I left the rest of that mysterious because who knows what humanity looks like in 3,000 years. <laughs> right. So uh, I do like the idea of leaving the aliens as a truly alien. This, this movie is one of the few where you don't try to make uh, people uh, just as aliens. Um, and even their, I mean, their language is very alien to us. Their thought process is very alien to us. Right. Um, how much did you have to do with, say, the design of the aliens in the film, or I know you had something to do with, with the language. Uh, uh, it was described in the book, but I think you helped refine that some, right? The alien shape started with Ted's work, right. really. Like, he, he called them heptapods in the right. story, and we definitely wanted to preserve that and carry that through. I had them as distinctly non-humanoid, I wanted the opposite of sort of a Star Trek alien right. where, you know, we have somebody with makeup and stuff on their head and that was it. Uh, but it wasn't until Denis came on board that we began looking at deep sea aquatic life that had just been discovered and found some inspiration in that kind of brand new life form. Uh, and it led to a more, I guess, squid-like appearance especially with the organic way that the, langu the written language, Heptapod B, uh, was presented to us through the weird inky uh, discharge. Uh, and so all of that was from, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, from the deep sea. Also, you know what it does for us is that kind of life form, to, to me at least, and to I think a number of, of, uh, of viewers or readers, uh, connotes a uh, Lovecraftian horror mm -hmm. and made us worry and fear and that sense of fear is again part of the theme of like how easily right. we can misinterpret something right and yes so much of this is about communication the difficulty of communication and and that people being different the other does get deep down into our our human genome of we're right. so tribal and you know that's what ultimately what we come it's really not them that we have to fear, it's each other and yes. so on. So, yes. uh, you added that angle, I think, of uh, the nations really sort of warring against each other almost in this process. Uh, how did you come to that uh, and making it, sort of reducing it from 100 nations uh, to, to 12 and then, and then really amping up the, the drama there? Uh, well, that was something very fragile. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had to be careful about that. There was no DNA of that in the short story. And so adding this on had to, felt, had to feel organic. And sadly, even four years ago, we could look at current events and realize how testy all of us are with each other and how quickly we are to make a false equivalence or jump to a conclusion about one another. And there's a weird echo chamber that happens in different countries and even in different communities within a country where we put a filter on anything from someone else and I've already decided to see it in a certain light. And so part of part of my mission in building the international glimpses that we get uh, was also to apply an American intelligence filter on top of it and try to paint it with the kind of paranoia that I feel uh, our own people might have on whatever's happening in another country. Whether or not that's the truth, we don't know. Right. Uh, and the only way we would know is if we had direct contact, which the science teams did for a while until that was taken away from them. Uh, so the idea that either like China is more of a warmonger or even Russia or anybody like that have the kind of an authoritarian grip, that's because it's the stereotype that we continue to think about with them and uh, that we may be perpetrating against them. But when you finally meet General Shang, when he finally meets Louise, he's a, he's a lovely gentleman, and you know, it, it turns out he's the one that turned the, the face of the, the whole encounter around and, and saved us from ourselves, really. The story has sort of an extreme version of this superior wharf hypothesis where the language uh, alters our perceptions. Uh, right. So, uh, but in, in real life, there's maybe, uh, we're sure that that happens at some level, but sure. it, it may not happen at, at, at a very extreme level, but was that something that you, um, uh, are were really drawn to and interested in. It happened with my father. Oh yeah. Yeah, my father is a or was a, an ancient history professor at OU for 
like three decades and constantly taught himself new languages. Uh, he would make his own flashcards and he would have it like Aramaic on one side and German on the other. So he was brushing up on one language as he was learning another one. Uh, I didn't know how deep that went until I once got in the car with him and I asked him a basic question and, and he looked at me and he blinked and he finally caught up with what I was saying as if he was switching back to English. Uh, and I didn't understand that there was a word for that until I came across Ted's story and I realized, oh yeah, there's a definite history for me with this and, uh, and I found it fascinating. So yeah, I wanted to explore that. Interesting. So uh, a technical question of it, when uh, Amy Adams' character goes into the space with the aliens in this sort of uh, cloudy atmosphere. Right. Um, what does that mean about the fact that uh, there was some suggestion earlier in the film that they had to sort of equalize the, uh, you know, there, there's, they have a different atmospheric maybe pressure, composition, and so on, and yeah. yet she seems to be able to breathe it. So was that like just an incorrect guess earlier, or were they doing something special there? I don't know. I had her wearing a mask and all yeah. the drafts of the script. So I think that was a moment where it just didn't work out from a technical standpoint. Right. That, um, you know, you know, being uh, authentic, authentic to that end um, crippled them in some other way. Right. Because, you know, because Dedean doesn't make those kind of things on accident. Like all these choices come very smartly uh, and around a team of experts. And I think we got to that point and something tripped us up and the mask was a no-go. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she did have uh, a whole setup on for a while. Interesting. So um, you wrote this as a spec script, right? Yes. Uh, and so how did that come about, uh, that you got involved in writing it, and then how many drafts of the script were there? Oh, there were a lot of drafts. Yeah. I mean, it, this was an iterative process. Like I had to do a lot of research and development just to try and find the right balance. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I was obsessed with the story mm -hmm. and I carried around that book for a long time trying to find a producer that was as passionate about it as I was. But I mean, honestly though, it's not, it's not a franchise film right? and it's a female lead. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk about, you know, a lot of crazy heady things. Right. Like the, mom, the minute I say linguistic relativity to another yeah. producer, they're just like, what, what are you saying? What are you talking about? I'm not gonna make this film. Uh, but Dan Levine and Dan Cohen at 21 Laps totally engaged with the script uh, or with the story. And we, we did our best to pitch it around first uh, and no studio bought it. Uh, we got a lot of conditions of like, we'll buy it if you, you know, change it to a man or mm -hmm. just make it an in invasion movie where someone punches an alien oh, at right, the end of it, right, you know, right. like that happens. But um, uh, I asked to write it on spec and that required permission from Ted because we needed to option the rights to the story for a longer period of time. And he was gracious enough uh, to take the risk with us. And then it, it was a full year. Like I started writing the night that he said yes. Wow. And it took a full year for me to have a script that I was excited about. And then we went through a number of other revisions just with me pecking away at it when I could, waiting for, pining away for Denis. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> It's, it's such a brilliant marriage of like the source material, the director, uh, yeah. you as the screenwriter. I think it, it really it has this authenticity to it where it, it does preserve this intellectual nature. So right. many questions raised in the short story, and, yeah. and they're there in the film as well. And sure. yet the drama is there Good. as well. So Well, that's Amy. Uh, yeah, uh, well, it's, I think it's everybody involved. But to me, it does something that Interstellar was trying to do, and I think uh, you know marry this story with a heart. Uh, a, a very personal story yeah. with this great scope of science fiction. I, I don't think Interstellar succeeded because I don't think it was as interwoven or it was, wasn't as there in the DNA as, as it was here. But right. a lot of films are, tr have tried to do this, but I think this is the first one I feel like really just I fell in love with that, that it, well, thank it, you. it does. Um, okay, that's not a question, but... <laughs> 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 but uh, um, was there any pressure to... Uh, you know, make it into a different, like, was there ever a draft that was, say, had a different budget attached, uh, more scenes that were a higher budget, for example, or, or even smaller? Uh, no, actually. No, the team involved in this always wanted to make the best version of this movie, mm -hmm. whatever that number was. That really wasn't an issue for us. So while there were more scenes in the script, for sure, and it got pared down in post-production, uh, to find sort of the most aerodynamic version of the story. Uh, 
we never tried to write to a specific budget point until we had to, you know, until like, oh, uh, we do not have the money for this. And, uh, and that rarely happened. Like, uh, there were no surprises. There was no suddenly, you know, giant warscape sequence that we had to deal with. Right. Yeah, so the, the, the design of the uh, alien language is sort of alluded to in the, in the book, but then we don't really see it like we do on film. Um, right. How did you have something to do with that? Uh, and, and, and then how did that come about? Was there a full syntax? Was there a whole, you know, backstory behind everything we see on screen? I gave myself way too much work with that, I yeah. tell you. <laughs> I was dissatisfied with my own written description of the heptapod B language, the locograms. I couldn't find something that like worked for me that didn't take a whole paragraph. And as a screenwriter, one of my prime directives is never to be a novelist. I want to try and find like the best description in haiku and, and have a very clean and, and elegant read for, for someone. So um, I got very frustrated and I complained to my wife, as I normally do when I'm, you know, I'm stuck on something in the script, and she said to me, very directly, why don't you just show me what you're talking about? And I sketched something out and I said, it's like this. And she says, well, just put that in the script. And I thought, can I do that? Can I even do that? Sure, I'll do that. And then I discovered that uh, screenwriting software, at least at the time, didn't allow for graphics to be inserted. There was just no way to make it happen. So I got really stubborn then. And I just created a bunch of blank spaces in the script and converted it to PDF and then manually inserted these handful of logograms, the circular symbols that I had decided, it's sort of the prototypical of what we ended up with. And, and I did that every time I had to send somebody a new draft. I did like a hundred times, and it was exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> and did it deviate very much from the, the final design version? I, I would say the main similarity is they always remain circular mm -hmm. because that's such a way to like uh, signify nonlinear orthography and to allude to the idea that they perceive time differently than we do. But I took a lot of sort of scripty look, uh, design elements uh, into mine and you know the, the, the version that I think Patrice Vermette and, and his wife, uh, that team, did building out the, the final design format is a different beast, but it also works. Like he actually developed in a complete language there. And so the, uh, the, uh, the Mathematica uh, software and the other stuff that Stephen Wolfram did for the, for the program or for the film uh, analyzes the logograms and shows all of the elements in, like in that scene in the movie where they're, they're dissecting it. That's all Patrice's uh, amazing like uh, language design. So. They did like hours and hours of work that like basically applied to just a few seconds of screen time, but it's there. Like there's a history and there's a whole story. Maybe we'll get a book on right. the logo. <laughs> the Universal Language by Louise Banks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, so tell me about what is this uh, story about Wolfram had, they made some software for the movie? I... Uh, we use Mathematica, which oh, okay. is like a famous yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. thing. And, and then, we, then we pulled Wolfram on board because he, wanted, he was curious about the script. And next thing I know, I was having a, a number of like conference calls with him where he would just take over my computer, and he was like, "Let me show you what I'm talking about." And like, so suddenly my you know my mouse is doing, my uh, my cursor was moving on its own, uh, and and that was just that was a, a lovely experience. He he provided so much scientific levity and authenticity to this that you know that we were constantly trying to strive toward. Um, there's nothing more satisfying than and, than getting an expert in the field to come in and say, well, nobody would do that, you yeah, know, yeah. and helping us. Right. Uh, last question, uh, what's your favorite science fiction movie? Oh, Close Encounters. Really? Yes. I can see the parallels. Yes. Mm -hmm.